Have you ever faced a complex decision-making situation where resources are limited and you need to optimize outcomes? This scenario is very common, from everyday tasks to the efficiency of a production line. And the solution lies in an algorithmic technique called linear programming. In today's fast-paced world, where every decision counts, mastering LP is not just a skill. It's a game changer, whether you're a business enthusiast, a problem solver, or someone seeking a competitive edge. Understanding linear programming is your gateway into strategic decision making. In this brief video, we will introduce linear programming and discover some of the most popular method that will empower you to solve complex optimization problem using linear programming with ease. Let's get started with an example. Imagine you're in the business of crafting chairs, specifically two types, indoor chairs and patio chairs. What makes this interesting is that the profit you can make from the patio chair is four times higher than indoor chair. So putting this together, the profit of the business that we should be maximizing can be formulated as x1 plus 4x2. Now here's the catch. You have just enough walnut wood to produce 100 indoor chairs and just enough bamboo to create 125 patio chairs. Each indoor chair takes one hour to make, while crafting a patio chair requires two hours. And time is money, and in this scenario, we have a total of 300 man hours available for production. So that's going to give us x1 plus 2x2 equal to less than 300 hours. Linear programming is an optimization technique for a system of linear constraints and a linear objective function. So everything is linear here. That's why it's called linear programming. The goal of linear programming is to find the values of decision variables that maximizes or minimizes the objective function. And that is given a set of linear constraints. These three components together form the general structure of the linear programming problem. Approach here and look into things visually. We have two positive variables here. So we are looking at uh, the top right quadrant. X1 should be less than 100 or equal to 100. And X2 has to be less than or equal to 100. 25. And the last constraint here says that the sum of x1 and x and 2x2 is less than or equal to 300. Now, let's clean this up a little bit to see what we have. So we have narrowed down the space to a region where x1 and x2 can take their values from. This is called a feasible region. We are lucky to have this here for this problem, but it's not always possible, specifically when you have when you when you have constraints that are too tight or too to, to, to loose. We are not done yet. Within this region, we need to find x1 and x2 such that they maximizes an objective function. While the graphical method might work with two variables, we need a systematic approach for this problem. Let me take you back to 1947. A student arrives late for his class, only to find an empty classroom and some mind-boggling stats problem on the blackboard staring back at him. What does he do? He decides to write these problems down, thinking it's just the next homework assignment. Little did he know, those problems were about to take him on a wild ride. Much to his surprise, the problem proved to be exceptionally challenging, demanding far more time and effort than he initially anticipated. Consequently, he found himself burning the midnight oil for the remainder of the week, diligently working on those problems. Days later, he walked into the class, handing in his solution to the professor who was not expecting it. The look on the professor's face 
priceless. Turns out, the student successfully cracked one of the most significant unsolved problems in the field. That brilliant student was George Dancing. He said, as in two-dimensional space, because the feasible region is convex, a set of points that achieve the optimal objective value must include a vertex of the feasible region. We call this feasible region formed by the intersection of these half spaces a simplex. The objective function is now a hyperplane, and because of the convexity, an optimal solution is still occurs at a vertex of the simplex. The simplex algorithm terminates when it reaches a local maximum, which is a vertex from which all neighboring vertices have a smaller objective value. Because this feasible region is convex and the objective function is linear, this local optimum is actually a global optimum. The moral of this story is a testament to the power of belief. If you think you can solve a problem, you're right. But if you believe it's unconquerable, you're also right. It all depends on you and begins with your mindset. Somebody comes to you and claims with a particular pair of x1 and x2, the optimum value of this objective function is 550. Hmm. How can we check this claim? Well, one thing we can do is to take a combination of the constraint to produce a new valid inequality that upper bounds the objective function. For example, we could take x1 less than or equal to 100 and multiply the both sides of this inequality by 1 and also take x2 less than or equal to 125 and multiply both, sort of, both sides of this inequality by 4 and after multiplying and summing this up, we're going to have a new valid inequality that is going to tell us something useful. So based on this new inequality, it's impossible for the objective function to take value larger than 600. This is great. But it doesn't exactly tell us how optimal 550 is. Can we bring this down even further? Can we find a tighter upper bound for the objective function? Finding the third inequality constraint that contains both x1 and x2 with one of the other. So in this particular case, I'm going to take the third one and also x2 less than or equal to 125. After multiplying and summing them up, we have a new inequality that provides a much tighter upper bound on the objective function. This indeed shows that 550 is optimal. And also the coefficient that we used here zero for the first one because we didn't use it, and then um, two and one are called dual multiplier. What I'd like to do here is to systematize the approach that we used in the previous example and come up with a general framework that can be used for any optimization problem to produce a tight upper bound on the objective function. So I'm going to start here by defining a multiplier for each of the constraints. After we multiply and add, we obtain a new valid inequality of this form. Now, we need the left-hand side of this inequality to be an upper bound on the objective function. This can be achieved by enforcing y1 plus y3 being greater or equal than 1 and y2 plus y3 being greater than or equal than 2. And finally, we also want the best possible upper bound, which means for the right-hand side of this inequality, we need to minimize it. Now, putting this together 
And also remembering that we need Y1 to Y3 to be positive in order to preserve the inequality after multiplication, we're going to get a brand new linear programming problem. Now, we're going to call the first one the primal problem and the second one the dual problem. Duality is one of the most fundamental concepts in linear programming. The duality theorem states that every feasible solution to the dual problem D provides a bound on the optimal value of the primal problem P. This relationship is fundamental in linear programming and has profound implication for optimization. It allows us to gain insight into primal problem by analyzing its dual. It provides a way to check the optimality of the solutions and to understand the trade-offs between primal and dual variables. Duality is a powerful tool that enhances our understanding of linear programming problems, making it a cornerstone in optimization theory. Let's take a look at the complexity of the simplex problem. In the worst case scenario, the simplex method can take an exponential amount of time, big O, 2 to the power of n plus m, to solve a linear programming problem, where n is the number of variables and m is the number of constraints. This means that there exists a specific LP problem where the simplex method will take an incredibly long time to solve, even on the most modern machines. When it comes to average time complexity, simplex method usually performs much better. Studies show that the average case complexity is closer to polynomial time, around big O n to the power of 3.5. This means that for most practical LP problem, the simplex method will find the optimal solution in a reasonable amount of time. Now, the problem space in the geometry of the feasible region can sometimes be really complex, and it would be still very valuable to find an op a, a polynomial time solution for this problem. So let's briefly look into some alternative method that scientists and researchers came up with over the years. The most important alternative to the simplex method is the interior point method. Unlike the simplex method that operates on the edges of the feasible region, interior point operates within the region, moving toward the optimum along a path inside the region. The algorithm uses a barrier function to transform the original problem into a series of unconstrained problems. It then solves these problems one by one, sequentially, staying within the interior of the feasible region. The other important alternative Another important alternative method is the ellipsoid method that operates on the geometry of the feasible region. It uses ellipsoids to iteratively shrink around the feasible region until an optimum solution is found. So the algorithm starts with an ellipsoid containing the feasible region. At each iteration, the ellipsoid is updated to a smaller one that still contains the feasible region. The process continues until the ellipsoid becomes small enough to approximate the optimal solution with a reasonable precision. compare these three methods that we have seen today. So for most practical linear programming problems, the interior point method is the perfect choice due to its superior performance for larger problems. The simplex method remains a valuable tool for smaller problems or educational purposes due to its simplicity and intuitive nature. The ellipsoid method on the other side 
also has guaranteed polynomial time complexity in worst case scenario, has primarily theoretical significance and is not used in practice due to its slow, slowness as the constant factor is much larger. We need to clarify that. The interior method is a family of methods and only the primal dual pass following version of it offers polynomial worst case guarantee. Let me introduce another important concept here, integer linear programming. And remember the linear programming example that we solved earlier, the chair problem. This is in fact an integer linear programming problem where decision variables must take an integer values. For example, it does not make sense if I say I'm going to make 125.7 chairs. That just does not make sense in the real world. But for simplicity, we ignore that fact and we treated that problem as a regular LP problem. Now, the question is, is integer LP any easier to solve? While it might seem so, in reality, it introduces a whole new layer of complexity. While the objective function and the constraints in ILP are still linear, the requirement that the decision variables are integer significantly impacts the difficulty of finding the optimal solution. Integer linear programming problems fall into the category of MP-hard problems. In simpler terms, this means that in the worst case scenario, finding the optimal solution may require exponential time. use some of the key players in LP solver landscape in Python. Two popular options are SciPy and Pulp. Both are user-friendly and excellent for simpler problems. And they're also suitable for beginner users to work with. But they may face efficiency challenges when it comes to working with massive LP problems. The other option you have out there is Pyomo. Pyomo is a powerful and flexible solver that comes with a steep learning curve. And the next option you have is CVX OPT, which is efficient for larger scale problems and focuses on interior point methods. And the other option you have out there is Google or Tools, an efficient and cloud friendly option or tools offers multiple solvers, including both interior point and simplex algorithm. Now let's see how can we solve a linear programming problem using the pulp library in Python. So after importing the pulp package with this line of code here, we are going to define a linear programming problem object called LP underscore problem with the objective of maximizing it. And then these two lines of code here are going to define variables x1 and x2 with lower bounds of zero and upper bounds of 100 and 125 respectively. And now it's time for us to define our objective function. And remember, we have previously specified that we are interested in maximizing this function. And after that, we are going to define our three inequality constraints one by one. And please note, when we use model plus equal the constraint, it's not like we're appending a tuple, but rather updating the model with new information. You're adding a new constraint, or you could be adding an objective to the existing LP problem object. And with the next line, we are going to call the pulp solver to solve this, this uh, linear programming problem for us. And then eventually we are going to print the result and we are also going to visualize it. And there you go. I hope you found this helpful and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.